Uh, my name is not Bob, as you might have uh, known, <laughs> so might have seen already. So uh, a couple of the, the printouts, I think we switched the, the talkers and something went wrong. So my name is Etienne. Um, if you were expecting Bob, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome to the first talk of the day. Uh, plenty of uh, firsts today, so my first time at, at FOSDEM, therefore also my first time speaking at FOSDEM, uh, but more importantly, the first time uh, we're introducing VV8 to the public, and uh, it's a very cool chance for us to uh, speak in front of an, an audience that is either interested in graphs or is experts on graphs, so that's really, really cool, and we're looking forward to your feedback. VV8 is the decentralized knowledge graph, and uh, we have the, the vision that any AI-related task can be reduced to semantic question answering, and that's what drives us in building uh, VV8. Uh, you can also see the word SEMI on these slides here. So SEMI is a company uh, that sponsors VV8. VV8 is an open source product in the uh, Creative Software Foundation, and uh, SEMI is a company that offers enterprise solutions on top of it and uh, supports the open source project. Cool, um, so for the next 30-ish minutes, I'll give you a bit of an introduction of what VV8 is, what the contextionary is that uh, powers VV8, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, what you can do with, with VV8, how we build it, and uh, a quick uh, live demo. So what do you get from it? I would love to, to spark that desire in you to just try it out. So we have a Docker Compose file, you can just do Docker Compose up, and um, yeah, play around with it. And as I said, I would uh, really love if we could have this, this targeted audience to get some feedback on both our API decisions, on our implementation decisions, um, et cetera. Cool, so you see a GitHub link here. So if you wanna check it out right now before I've even told you what it is, <laughs> feel free. Um, it's Creative Software Foundation slash VV8. On the title slide, we had the official name VV8, the Decentralized Knowledge Graph. Here I've added another word, which is the word contextual, and I'll explain what we mean by contextual decentralized knowledge graph. So uh, to understand the, the part contextual, I want to introduce the contextionary. That is an AI-based natural language tool that helps add uh, context words, and I think it's best explained if uh, we have an example. So uh, think of the word king. If you have any kind of association, so these are the associations I had while uh, building these, these slides. King could be a ruler, a monarch, also man and male is, is somewhat related to the word king, and all kinds of other associations. So we have fancy, royal, could be an oppressor, could be well-spoken, and uh, depending on how hungry you are this morning, could also be hamburgers. <laughs> um, but if we if we um, take a look at this, this word king, sort of in a, in a vector space and seeing as king of the, the sum of all of these words that uh, make up the context, then we can perform basic mathematical operations on it. And uh, one that I've done here is taking this man and male and subtracting that and uh, adding the word woman or female. And then we immediately as humans, so I assume you're all humans, we've already established that we have one robot in the audience. I hope the rest of you are human <laughs> because then it's, it's very intuitive to us that the word uh, king becomes the word queen if all the, all the uh, rest of the context is the same. And uh, this is uh, something that's, that's traditionally been very hard for computers and the contextionary uses that context to make these kind of uh, things very easy. So you could, of course, when you query something, you could, of course, just uh, match for the string. If you already know that you're interested in both genders of king or queen, you could just say king or queen. Uh, but uh, these kind of uh, queries won't scale uh, so well. So um, if you say you have a relation between one entity, say uh, a king lives in a castle, and then for castle you have maybe the word fort, uh, you have these, these kind of um, different ors that you have to do and it won't scale so well. Whereas if you have the context, we just match one context to one other context, and that makes that much easier and will be extremely helpful if you uh, don't know the ontology or if you're operating on foreign data or if the uh, data quality just isn't as good as you'd hope for. So other examples for how we can use the uh, contextionary. So uh, think of the word location, place, city. Uh, for an example, let's say we have three uh, lists of restaurants, like the top restaurants in your region or in your country, and uh, these are made by, by different people, and everyone has a different way of saying where the restaurant is located. So the first one says location, the second one says place, so, uh, the third one says uh, city. 
again, for, for us humans, it's very easy to see that this is really the same property that they're talking about. But if we're just matching strings, this becomes very, very hard. So uh, by using context, we can very easily identify that this is uh, the same property that we're talking about. Then there's also the opposite. So I have two uh, homonyms here, seal and seal. So we can use the context for disambiguation. So uh, think of seal could be an animal. So we have the, the mammal, um, or we have the animal, the, the, the seal, and you also have the seal as in to seal an envelope. So depending on these different contexts, if you have mammal, ocean, etc., you can build the centroid of these words in the vector space, and this is what defines the context, and this is how you can disambiguate between seal the animal and seal the, the envelope, where you would have, where, uh, sorry, seal the seal as on an envelope, where you would have stamp in the context, envelope, um, maybe security protection, these kind of things. Cool, the next word that we had in the definition is decentralized. So uh, in order for something to be decentralized, you need to have many different things that you can then either combine to something centralized or spread out to something decentralized. You can operate VV8 completely standalone, but uh, you can also establish a peer-to-peer uh, -peer network of uh, different VV8s. So why would you want to do that? One reason is because it gives you the ability to completely own your own data, so you don't have to send your own data away somewhere if it's, if it's private data, if it's customer data, you have to think of GDPR um, protections, etc. But you can also still, because it's a network, you could enrich it with other data. So uh, think of Wikipedia, for example. Like a lot of human knowledge is very easily accessible, again, to humans on uh, Wikipedia. But for machines, it's not necessarily that easily accessible. Yes, you can parse the text, etc., cetera, um, but establishing relationships is a bit more difficult. So you can, of course, say, okay, if I'm talking about a car in my, um, in my database, I can add a link to the Wikipedia article of car. But it would, of course, be much nicer if you had that Wikipedia knowledge in some sort of structured graph form, and uh, you can get to keep all these kind of relationships. So this is something that's possible with VV8. You just connect your own VV8, your private VV8, where you have your private data, with a public VV8 that has, for example, Wikipedia data. You can also connect uh, several VV8s to um, combine their different advantages. So I'll get into uh, modularity a bit later on, on how we um, use modularity in VV8. But you could, for example, say, okay, I have one VV8 that's built to be very fast. So maybe it has an in-memory database where, um, yeah, we don't store anything on disk, everything in memory, so, so it's super fast. But uh, we have another data, uh, another VV8, where we have, we have a data set that's so large that we can't do that. And then uh, by having it decentralized, we could combine those two VV8s to have the uh, best of both worlds, ideally. Uh, the next term, and this is one that I already received a question about this morning, so what does knowledge graph mean? And in fact, that's not entirely easy to, to answer because there's, I don't think there's like one agreed upon definition. Um, one, one very common way to, to refer to the knowledge graph is uh, the way that Google uses it. So Google calls their knowledge graph the knowledge graph, and this is what Google uses to answer uh, structured questions. So if you ask Google who is the president of, let, let's maybe not go to that, let's say, who is the chancellor of Germany? That one's a bit safer, <laughs> safer I think. Uh, then Google will say, okay, the chancellor of Germany is Angela Merkel. Um, maybe add her age, her education, how she got uh, there, her party affiliation, etc. And uh, this info, this related info, is of course very easy to uh, retrieve because there's a graph behind it. Uh, for us, in, uh, with VV8, we also focus on the, the second part very much, so we are in the, in the graph track here. And uh, for us, that means we're building on existing graph technology. So we're building on top of um, existing graph databases. We're using GraphQL for our API because we think that makes it uh, much easier to use graphs, uh, especially for people who don't have any familiarity uh, with graphs. And uh, additionally, we keep adding like more and more semantic tools to uh, VV8 over time, turning a sort of regular graph into a uh, knowledge graph. So um, it's very easy with, with existing graph technologies to query for this kind of related information, but it's not so easy yet to understand these kind of questions. So if you just put a natural language question in, there's two parts basically, the natural language part, and then once we have that in a structured form, there's the graph querying part. And the combination of that is basically VV8. So what can you use uh, VV8 for? 
So as I said already, you can combine data across industries, but because you have the, the uh, contextionary, you don't necessarily have to harmonize your ontologies. You don't have to make sure that location is renamed to place so it's consistent because you have the, the context. And this gives you different abilities in, in all kinds of business cases. So uh, think, for example, you are a bank and you have bank transactions and you see that people are uh, buying uh, Netflix subscriptions and based on the price you can tell that this Netflix subscription uh, includes the 4K feature. So let's say if the bank wants to uh, work together with a retailer, they could now think, okay, is there any kind of correlation between buying the 4K uh, Netflix subscription and uh, actually buying a TV that is capable of displaying 4K content? So that's sort of synergies that can be uh, created there. Another example would be um, um, mobile providers have uh, movement data of, uh, related to, to postal codes. So let's say uh, there's a specific street and you want to know how many people from a specific uh, postal area or from a specific area in your city go to that street. And of course you don't have the individuals there because that would be horrible for privacy concerns, but just groups sort of overall, this many people from this area go there. So this kind of data is, is very useful for any kind of business that would be in that street. They could say, okay, maybe we have to drop some pamphlets at some other place because we don't get enough uh, customers from this kind of area, uh, even though it's not that, that far away. Or um, you could use this for, um, for restaurants, for example. So let's say you're a restaurant chain and you're thinking about where should I open my new restaurant. So if you have uh, postal codes of people that visit that area, you also have demographic data. So you can say, okay, does my restaurant fit into that kind of demographic? Also, uh, transport sector. So let's say you have two postal codes that are equally as far away from your street that you're looking at, but uh, uh, people are only showing up from, from one postal code, not from the other one. Maybe there's something wrong with the transportation. So all kinds of insights where it makes sense to combine data from uh, different industries in a decentralized way. You can of course also very easily gain uh, more insights into the data you already have. So you don't have to use VV8 uh, as part of a network. You can also just use it standalone and just um, yeah, have an easy interface onto the data because you don't have to know the ontology so well. You can uh, enrich your data. So this example I had before with uh, Wikipedia for example, you can use that to say find more customers. If you have data about your own customers, identifying the who are your most profitable customers, like what are the, the aspects that make these customers your, your best customers. Um, you don't want to share that data, of course, you want to keep that. Um, but additionally, it would be very nice if you just had like a database of potential, if you're in the B2B sector, like just a list of companies um, in a structured form that would um, match your criteria so you can apply your own um, criteria of what makes this customer a good customer uh, on that list. Another example would be fraud detection. So typical machine learning example uh, is spam detection. So one of those sort of, if you look into machine learning, one of the first examples is you have a list of bad words and if these words appear in your email, your email is uh, probably spam. With uh, a graph, with sort of structured knowledge in a, in a graph, you can uh, take this much, much further. You can say not just matching for words, but uh, maybe have behavior in there, and this you can use for fraud detection or any kind of uh, other behavioral analyses. Cool, so let me just drink something. <laughs> and then uh, dive into our first example query. So I said that we're using uh, GraphQL, and the reason we do that is because we want to bring a graph technology to people who don't necessarily even know what a graph is, but uh, who we believe could uh, benefit from that. In order to understand that uh, query, let me define a couple of things. So uh, the root query uh, that you see here is, is a network, and we um, distinguish between local and network. So if you have that standalone mode and you're just interested in the data that you have locally, it would be a local query, whereas a uh, network query would be anything where you tap into your network. We then have uh, things. So things are anything that are things in real life. So it could be cars, could be airplanes, could be persons. Uh, and actions would be any kind of interaction. So in the context of, um, of an airline, uh, the action would be a flight, for example. And then the next word we have here is fetch. So fetch indicates that we're doing something fuzzy. So we have the word get, where you do something very explicit. You know what network peer you want to get the data from. You know exactly their ontology, what you want to get. And uh, fetch is the opposite. So fetch is if you, you don't know if you have this, this kind of fuzzy search that you want to do. 
Um, so let me give you a bit of a scenario around this. Let's say we have uh, airports all over your country, all over your region, you have different airports. And these airports have any kind of local airport management system. So um, you don't really know the exact data. This could be a different system anywhere. Um, but you know that each of these airports has uh, data of what planes are currently on the ground. So let's say we're an aircraft service company, uh, a fictional aircraft service company, like a very mobile one that can just immediately drive to an airport if there's an airplane and needs servicing. Is, don't think it's that flexible in real life, but it doesn't matter for, for our example. So now we want to say, okay, um, I, I'm good at servicing uh, airplanes of the type uh, 777. Where can I find them? And this is where this, this query comes in. So we're saying um, on this where clause here, give me um, anything where the class is plain with a certainty of 80%. So certainty is one of the constructs that, that we introduced here to sort of narrow down this, this fuzziness. And uh, by that we mean anything that is related to plane, but we don't mean where the string is close. So the word planet, for example, with a T at the end, would be very close if you, if you compare the strings, but of course not in the context. So in the context which we want to match for is airplane, aircraft, these kind of things. Then uh, the second one, um, uh, the second property that we're interested in is the model. In this case, uh, should equal 777. And again here, we don't know if this local airport management system says, uh, the model is, uh, or the, the property is called model, or maybe model name, or just name, etc. So again, we try to match this with a fuzzy search here. Then, of course, the word plane uh, is also another one of those very ambiguous words. So plane could be an airplane, plane could be a sort of two-dimensional level or surface in a three-dimensional room. A uh, plane could be in woodworking, you have uh, the thickness planer to plane. So uh, we have the ability to add, um, to, to add keywords here to make it clear to the machine of what context we're talking about. So in this case, we're adding the word airline and airport. And then uh, if you hear these words and the next word you hear is plane, you immediately think of airplane and not of any kind of the, the other planes. And uh, this context here, in this case, we're, we're entering it manually in the GraphQL query. But if you, if you think one step further, let's say maybe um, this question that you got to send to, to VV8, uh, it didn't come from a GraphQL query, but maybe you asked your Alexa on it, then context could just be like, what questions did you ask before? So if you were talking about airports and airlines for the past minute, the next question that you ask about planes is most likely gonna be an airplane and not any other kind of plane. Cool, so uh, now we're transitioning a bit more into to the technical part. Uh, the first one is here, how is VV8 different from uh, existing graph technology? So um, VV8 is not a graph database, and VV8 does not try to replace existing graph technology in any way. VV8 tries to, to enhance it, to uh, build on top of it. So if you're sort of faced with the question, should I use VV8 or should I just use any of the existing graph databases, how, how would they be differing? Uh, the first one of the USPs would be ease of use. So keep in mind here uh, that we're targeting um, a, a demographic, we're targeting an, an audience that isn't so familiar with graphs. So I assume people in this room here probably know how to write a, a gremlin query, a cipher query, a SQL query, these kind of things. But um, even if you don't, uh, even if you do, you might um, say that, okay, these do definitely have a steep learning curve. And uh, we're using GraphQL uh, to, to make that easier. So with GraphQL, you have the ability to discover your API. So if you don't know the API, and if you don't know the ontology, you have to use graphical, uh, or you can use graphical, which um, gives you this, this sort of auto-suggestion of what there is to use. And um, we think that we can reach a, a larger audience than with um, the uh, existing query languages, at a cost, of course, as with any uh, abstraction. Then uh, we have natural language processing and the, the contextionary. So contextionary, I explained already. Natural language processing, this is sort of what we're looking, looking into right now. Like ideally, GraphQL would just be sort of the, the middle layer, but in the end, you can just ask a, a question, ask it to, to Alexa, or just type it in a way, and VV8 will uh, give you an answer. Then uh, the third part is also the modularity of the data store. So VV8 does not depend on any one specific graph database. So we try to, we try to make this very modular. Uh, the first connector that we've built so far is on Janus Graph. 
but uh, there's nothing sort of Janus graph specific. You could also put in a, a write a connector for Neo4j, Redis graph, what have you. One of the reasons for this could be the cap theorem, for example. So let's say you need high availability, then you have to make that trade-off. Do I want strong consistency or do I want uh, partition tolerance? And uh, in this way, so we've picked Janus graph, which uh, we in turn back by Cassandra which is known for its eventual consistency. So we said, okay, we need high availability, we need scaling, but we don't need um, the uh, strong consistency for the first use cases. So a bit more on the architecture. The user-facing APIs that we have, I've already talked about GraphQL, and we think it, it makes it very easy for, for users to discover the API. Uh, but we also, of course, have a REST API, so for importing, for example, if you have a flat list of your data and references are basically just IDs, then a REST API comes in very handy, so that's the, the other API that we have. VV8 is built as a microservice, so by that we mean that VV8 has a relatively small concern. Um, we're currently looking into, as I said, these uh, natural languages uh, tools where you can just ask the question. And there we've discovered this is a completely different language stack. So VV8 is written in Go uh, and uh, most of the libraries there are written in Java. So that will probably be its own microservice. So we're benefiting from all the technologies that are out there. We're adhering to 12-factor principles. We're um, using Docker um, in our everyday development. We're um, building or we're betting on Kubernetes, like we're making sure that everything runs on the cloud. That is also one of the reasons why we chose uh, Golang. So we're using Golang 1.11 here. So yay, Go modules for anyone who's using Golang. Um, because we think Golang has just proven to be a a uh, very good language in the in the cloud environment. It's sort of a good trade-off between um, stability, ease of use, performance. Yes, there might be languages that are a bit easier to use. Yes, there might be languages that perform a bit better. But overall, we think Golang is a very, very good uh, trade-off. Then uh, we're putting a, m a lot of emphasis on the design of our APIs. So we always design them first. In the case of GraphQL, we just have a small prototype, which is like completely decoupled from VV8, which we really just use for prototyping and uh, trying to get the API as, as good as possible. For the REST API, um, we're using Go Swagger. So that has come in very handy to just write the Swagger document first, then build the API to, to match it. And we're focusing very, very much on uh, modularity, on pluggability. And for this, I have two more examples. So the first one is, don't, don't worry, by the way, if you can't read this, this code example here. It's not, not meant to be read. <laughs> um, so for the, the database connector, um, I've mentioned this before already, we want to be able to exchange databases. And uh, one of the reasons I've mentioned already, so the CAP theorem, you might a consistent database or you might uh, require a database that is safe against partition tolerance. Um, but there's other, other uh, reasons, of course. So scaling, scaling is probably the mo most uh, motivation for us to start with a Janus graph. Could also be speed, could be any kind of specific features. So we really, we don't know yet every use case. And this is really something where we're saying, okay, we need to be a bit generic here and we need to be a bit um, modular. So for a database connector, really uh, that's just an interface in our code and anything that implements that interface is a database connector, which uh, gives us the ability to keep the remainder of the, the application completely database agnostic. I've already mentioned that the first connector we have is Janus Graph. So Janus Graph in turn backed by Cassandra for the data store using Elasticsearch for the indexing and we're currently looking into potentially also adding uh, Spark for analysis queries. So the reason for this code snippet over here is we have uh, one, one empty connector that you can get started with. It's called the uh, foobar connector, very creative naming here. <laughs> and um, this code snippet is just to say, so this is the, the go doc comment on one particular method that you can implement if you want to build a connector. And uh, what we're trying to, to uh, indicate with this kind of a code example here is that we try to keep it very, very well documented. So here you have an example GraphQL query that you would have to resolve for this uh, kind of connector, an example return value, etc. The uh, second part where we want to be very modular is uh, our authentication and authorization scheme. So in case anyone is familiar uh, with how authentication works on Kubernetes, it's very much modeled after that. Um, if, you're, if you're not familiar, don't worry. 
um, authentication is very, very modular there, and we also try to keep that, that modularity. So we again say anything for authentication can be a, a plugin. So for example, you can just use basic auth for developing in production. You could use OpenID Connect, for example, which in turn um, sort of uh, gives you the ability to include many different authentication schemes. But also we saying, okay, there might be some obscure enterprise authentication scheme that we've never even heard of. So again, we try to be very flexible. And also here, anything really can be an authentication plugin in VV8 that um, resolves to is the user authenticated, yes or no, and also extracts the username or a group so we can then use that for the authorization. In the authorization, again, very, very much modeled after Kubernetes, we want to have a role-based access uh, system. So in this example here, uh, this particular user or, um, or a group would have permissions to read on write on things asterisk, so on, on anything in the things API. But therefore, uh, in this example, they wouldn't have any kind of permission to read anything or do anything on the actions API, for example. If you're interested in that, there's a GitHub link with the uh, full proposal. Cool, so I mentioned uh, Semi on the very first slide, and I think in, in the context of open source, it's also always very important to, to um, yeah, say who's behind it. We all know that software development is very expensive, and uh, who are the people behind it, and what do they get out of it? So in the case of uh, VV8, uh, Semi is the company, and it's, it's called Semi, not Semi. Um, the uh, SEMI offers enterprise support and consulting, so for enterprise companies it's very important to, to get something like VV8 up and running very, very quickly and uh, to get all kinds of help with um, yeah, the enterprise specific things. Uh, advanced network abilities is also there, so um, I, I've, I've mentioned these examples before, like wouldn't it be great if you have a VV8 that is, has been filled with uh, Wikipedia knowledge, for example, or a, v, uh, a VV8 that has uh, a directory of small and medium businesses. And uh, these examples were not too far-fetched, so this is something that VV8 can provide. Another thing is uh, custom contextionary. So, so far I've always talked about the contextionary, and in the open source version we have a general purpose contextionary that is again trained based on uh, knowledge or based on content from Wikipedia but uh, you might have the, the, the need for an industry-specific contextionary, for example, and this is something that uh, SEMI can then also provide. Uh, there's also a playground user interface. So this is just a user interface to, to visualize uh, your graph and visualize your data, which is really cool. Unfortunately, it's not open source at the moment, so that's why it's not the content of here. So um, next up, I would like to give you a very, very quick um, demo, which will be interesting with the, with the handheld microphone here. Um, but before we go to the, the quick demo part, uh, let me just quickly give you the roadmap so that um, you know what I can demo, what, what is vision and what is already there. So we do have our REST API completed, so for importing these kind of things. Um, on the GraphQL API, uh, we currently have everything that is related to local queries. On uh, network queries, we have the get queries and get meta queries, so you can query information that is very specific to, um, to one uh, network node. We do have the contextionary completed. What we don't have, though, is uh, queries that make uh, a lot of use of it uh, so far. We have uh, a genus graph connector, so that was the, the, first sector, the, the, the first connector that we decided to build, and that is completed. We are currently building uh, the network, these fuzzy requests. So this example, this is actually something that I started picking up uh, yesterday. So this is very, very much in development right now. Uh, also the authentication and authorization proposal is sort of an accept accepted proposal, but nothing has been implemented yet. And uh, we're currently researching very much this uh, natural language uh, thing. So to get closer to our vision, to answer any AI related task with a natural language question. Um, our team member Laura is currently looking into NLP technologies to put this on top of GraphQL basically. Cool, so let me demo something for this. I quickly have to switch, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, first I have to tell the screen that it should not, should mirror, cool. And now we just have to find, ah, cool, that, that worked. 
Awesome. So here we have a GraphQL query. Let's start with the first one. So this is a local get query. We're querying for things. Uh, in this case, um, okay, I think I'm missing an example, but that doesn't matter. Um, in this case, we're saying um, we want cities, and of the city, we want the name, we want the population. Then we have a cross reference. So, in the, the context of graphs, this is an edge onto a property called country. And again, from this country, you want to get the name and the uh, population. Uh, additionally, we have a filter here. So, um, this filter says we want to get any city where um, the path in country on the property country with the property name does not equal to Germany. So, in our huge data set of uh, four cities, I think, that we have here for, for demo purposes. We're now only getting uh, the two cities that are in the Netherlands. So we have Rotterdam here with a population of 1.8 million, Amsterdam with uh, also 1.8 million, in the Netherlands with uh, 17 million. So if I then remove this, this where filter, run this query again, then I also need to remove this. Um, then we have uh, all the the cities that we have in our database, which also adds Berlin in Germany and uh, Düsseldorf. So again, the, the cool thing here, because it's, because it's GraphQL, you really don't have to know the ontology. You can just rely on GraphQL to basically also autocomplete that, so rely on the typing system. This is something that we think makes GraphQL a very cool tool to, to put on, on top of graphs. Uh, then here we also have an aggregate query. So in this query, we're saying, okay, we're aggregating things again and uh, we want to group our things. So whenever we do an aggregation, we have to group it by something. In this case, we're grouping on a primitive property that we call is capital. So that's a Boolean property, meaning we get two results, one uh, where this is uh, false, when it's true. And then we have just a very simple aggregation here on uh, any non-capitals. The largest in our data set is 1.8 million. The smallest would be 600,000. So that's uh, Rotterdam and Dusseldorf. And uh, then for capitals, we have Amsterdam and Berlin, so uh, 3.5 million. And uh, for the minimum one, 1.8 million. So that's the, the uh, quick GraphQL demo part. So now I need to get back to my slides, which were here. Cool. Thank you very much for, for holding the microphone. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing my speaker view anymore, so please do tell me when we're out of time. Um, I would very, very much be interested now in a bit of uh, feedback from uh, this room here. First of all, um, for, of course, now, but also also later. Uh, a bit of contact information. You can contact semi at semi.network. That's the, the homepage. If you have any kind of um, sales-related questions, so for, for enterprise services, etc., please reach out to either David or Misha. You can, of course, also contact me. Uh, why would you want that? Uh, I'm uh, sorry, uh, currently one of the uh, core developers of uh, VV8, so if you have any kind of development-related things, um, there's my contact info, there's my uh, homepage, GitHub and Twitter that you can follow. Also my YouTube channel, where I have a couple of software engineering and DevOps-related uh, tutorials, so if you're interested in that, please do check it out. But more importantly, now, uh, feedback. So for feedback, we're very interested into any kind of general questions or general feedbacks, but also some uh, specific points. So the API design. So we're saying, okay, we're using GraphQL um, to try and make it easier to use. What do you think? Is that a good idea or do we strip abilities? Like, is there anything that you can only do with Gremlin or can only do with Cypher um, that we, we definitely miss here? And very similar on the connectors. Like, do you think it's a good idea to have this kind of abstraction to be modular? Or uh, do you think there are some kind of, let's say, specific features that only Neo4j have that, that uh, we would benefit from? So this would be one of the, the other questions. So feel free. So we have four minutes left for questions. If you have questions. Perfect. <laughs> first one, first one, yeah, 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 I'll repeat it. Yes, yes. So the question was, is there a way to um, not just fetch anything specific, but basically the entire graph? Like if you don't, don't know the ontology, but you know you want to query a specific domain, is there a way to just get anything? Um, yes, on the um, 
GraphQL API, we have an introspection function where you can basically do exactly that, saying you are in a network, you know your own ontology in the network, but you don't necessarily know the ontology of your peers, but you do know that, for example, your peers are in one industry, then uh, you can use these kind of queries to just discover what it is uh, in that ontology. Thank you. Other questions? I got a question. Yes. What does the, what does the SDL look like, the uh, Java, uh, GraphQL schema for your API? What does it look like? Like, yeah. like how, mm -hmm. how, how, how do you mean that? <laughs> so usually, usually GraphQL APIs are driven schema first. So you write a schema and then you have the API on top of that. Yeah. And then just wanted to know, do you have a, like a static SDL or is it generated or how does it look like? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I understand the question. Um, yes, so we have a, a fixed ontology that every VV8 has to has to have. Fixed in this case doesn't mean it's it's fixed. Sort of, it just means you you predefine it, but you can change it all the time. And then uh, we um, have in the peer-to-peer -peer network, we basically cache the ontology of every peer. So peers can have different ontologies, and then we create the the GraphQL schema um, of of that uh, sort of in a in a yeah, sort of it is cached at the moment you do the query, of course, because that's, that's just how GraphQL works, but it can change at any time. Just have to invalidate the cache and update it. Another question. Uh, so the question was, when we built the contextionary, how, how automated is that, that process? And uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? And, and what kind of data sets uh, can we consume? So uh, the, the process to train the contextionary is extremely expensive um, in, in sort of machine power. So we run that sort of once on one data set. Uh, the, the current uh, uh, contextionary that we have is run on Wikipedia. So it's basically just, just text. Um, but anything that machine learning can do can basically use to, to train the contextionary. So for, um, for um, as industry specific contextionaries, if let's say an enterprise company would have documentation on specific machines, for example, then we could use that kind of uh, documentation uh, to train the industry specific one. And uh, yes, it's automated, but it's, it's not something we can do on the fly. Like it just takes spinning up a, a big cluster somewhere in a cloud and running it for a long time. <laughs> Another question? Uh, I I can't say that entirely with certainty. I think not at the moment, but um, please do reach out to Bob if you're interested. Um, Bob at semi.network, he can tell you more precisely, but I think it's not open source. Cool. cool. And with that Perfect, <laughs> out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending and your feedback. So our next